What gives rise to these wonderful differences in personality? That's what we study in our field of personality psychology, or more broadly considered personality science. When we became mammals, we developed a part of the brain known as the neocortex. Neo means new, cortex means roof. So the neocortex is the new roof of the brain, accreted to or added on to the paleocortex, or the old roof of the brain. And one of the functions of the neocortex is to allow us to think before acting, to prognosticate before engaging in mere behavior. But in order for the neocortex to function properly, it needs to be aroused or activated up to an optimal level of arousal. Now, too high a level of arousal means that you're just revving too high. And it's dysfunctional in terms of carrying out our everyday projects and tasks. Chronically, extroverts are under the optimal level of arousal necessary to carry out their tasks and projects effectively. And consequently, they need to extrovert themselves. They need to seek stimulation. They need to engage with people. And that is why they will act the way they do, and we can spot it in everyday behavior. We interact in different ways. But extroverts, to be comfortable in interaction, like to stand close like to have a lot of body contact, a lot of gaze or mutual gaze. Um, we found in some research that uh, extroverts use more diminutive names when they meet somebody. So if the person you're meeting is Charles, it rapidly becomes Charlie, and then Chuck, and then Chuckles baby. <laughs> Whereas for introverts, it remains Charles until you're given the pass to a more intimate level. Introverts, contrastingly, are over that optimal level of arousal. They need to get their situation, their, their stimulation level down, less stimulating, in order to carry out their tasks effectively. And there is that optimal level of arousal right in between. If I place a drop of lemon juice on your tongues, if I could do that right now, we would find that the introverts in the room would salivate more <laughs> in response to the lemon juice than our five extroverts would, because introverts respond more to stimulation and therefore prefer lower amounts of it. There's one interesting experiment by the psychologist Russell Gein that has even found that if you give introverts and extroverts math problems to solve with different levels of background noise, the introverts will do better when the background noise is lower, and the extroverts will solve the problems better when the background noise is higher. Introverts and extroverts have very different attitudes to risk-taking. Extroverts are much more likely when they see something that they want to go for it. And this actually goes down to the level of neurochemistry. Extroverts have been found to have more active reward networks in their brain, so that if they see something that they want, or if they're contemplating a promotion, or whatever it is, um, literally their, their reward networks become more activated. And they get excited, and this is accompanied by all kinds of joyful and fizzy emotions. And this can be a really great thing, because it helps us to seize the day when we have these kinds of feelings. But the downside to this way of being is that when you're that focused on a reward, you don't see the warning signals that are also coming at you saying, hmm, you know, maybe you should stop. Maybe there's a problem here. I mean, you, you literally don't see them as much. And introverts are much less likely to fall prey to that dynamic. I mean, they sometimes do. This stuff is not black and white. But they're less likely to fall prey to it. And so this is not to say that introverts don't also take risks, because they do but they tend to be more slow and more circumspect about it. Um, one study of a, a, a group of traders at a London investment bank found that the introverts were the most successful traders, you know, probably because of this way of processing information. Now, in fact, some of our transformative leaders in history have been introverts. I'll give you some examples. Eleanor Roosevelt, Rosa Parks, Gandhi, all these people describe themselves as quiet and soft-spoken and even shy. And they all took the spotlight, even though every bone in their bodies was telling them not to. I've come to believe that introversion and extroversion are as profound a part of who we are, as core to our identities, as our gender. And that, therefore, it's very important to understand where we truly fall on the introvert-extrovert spectrum.